Thank you, everyone. Welcome to JupiterCon. I hope everybody has a fantastic time while they're here. And I'm really delighted to be able to talk about some of my favorite things. So, learning. Learning enables businesses to build prosperity, academics to share knowledge, and researchers to explore new ideas. But it does much more than that. In fact, in seventh grade, it got me into the math team. What? You guys, who doesn't want to be on the math team? We love the math team. Picture this. It's 1977. I'm in sixth grade. I'm kind of a rebellious teen, but my passions are playing soccer and learning the laws of physics the hard way. But that's a story for another day. That year, I spent much of my day in a class called Project Venture. Project Venture was for kids that were advanced in math or language arts. Now, there were four people in my class, myself and three nerdy math team boys who only wanted to play Dungeons and Dragons during class. Pretty soon, I began skipping these Project Venture classes and astutely thinking that the teacher would not miss one of her four students. <laughs> When she sent notes home about my wonderful behavior, I crumpled up the notes and threw them, most of them in the trash. Thankfully, at the start of seventh grade, a thing of wonder entered my life. The Apple II. Waz's little box, its color, simple language, and interactivity drew me in. It had amazing colors, other than the green or amber or gray of the Bell Labs mainframe that I was using the year before. I really wanted to learn how to use this thing of wonder. The Apple II put me in control and let me experiment. I had a blank canvas to create from. I learned by writing small programs and iterating when things didn't work. The best part of the graphics were the graphics. They were amazing. Did I mention we had color, finally? It took me a couple months until I could recreate the Atari breakout game on the Apple II, but at the end of that, I was hooked. So one day, the three D&D &D boys and their math team coach asked me to compete with them in an upcoming competition. They felt, for whatever reason, that I would improve their chances. Being a cool kid and maybe not a rule follower, I didn't want to go. Yet, I knew my three D&D classmates had worked very hard and wanted me to join them. So ultimately, I agreed to go. I did okay in my one and only math team competition, taking sixth out of 240 students. But more importantly, I learned a valuable life lesson that day about helping others And that wouldn't have happened unless the Apple II opened the door for me to learning and also to connect to other people. Share wonder, change the world. The Apple II did that for me. Quite unexpectedly, in 2013, I felt those same feelings of wonder and possibilities again when I began using the notebook. Like Minecraft of this generation, or the Apple II when I was 12, the notebook was fun and it was empowering. The notebook encouraged me to explore. There were no artificial barriers to getting started. Just type some things and hit shift enter. I personally began exploring Music 21, a music theory library, and found it could do quite powerful things in five lines of code or less. Music as the notebooks, have a universal appeal. While using these notebooks, when volunteering at Fab Lab in San Diego, a community maker space, I found that kids and adults who had never programmed were intrigued and wanted to create music. When I pulled up a digital synthesizer example using notebooks and the widgets, I found students and myself asking, what if we try this? What if we do that? This is really cool. The interactivity and visualization of information engaged us and inspired us to learn more. When teaching Python workshops, 
I saw the notebook broke down the barriers of fear, whether learning introductory Python or whether people were experienced R developers learning the Python scientific stack. In addition to individuals at our community workshops, at the same time, businesses, academics, researchers were exploring the notebooks as well. In 2014, my dear friend Lorena Barba gave an enthusiastic keynote at SciPy 2014 at, about how the notebooks were connecting her students to learning. I agreed wholeheartedly and hoped the notebooks would go viral. And wow, go viral they did. Now it's 2018, and we've seen huge adoption of the notebooks in many disciplines. We've got close to three million notebooks in the wild, and Jupyter and our many contributors were recently honored with the ACM Software Systems Award. So now, as I look forward to the next five years, there are so many possibilities for our future. As I think back to my time as a software engineering manager or a product manager at a Silicon Valley startup serving the new cellular phone industry, and as a grad student researching and writing a thesis on applied economics, I could see how the notebook would, profoundly, would have profoundly impacted my work in each of these cases. I want you to take a moment and think about how you plan to use the notebooks in the next few years. In the words of Walt Disney, a creator of wonder, if you dream it, you can build it. And looking at our future, I believe that. Open source is our greatest strength. It gives us superpowers. Open source lets us achieve things like Jupiter that would be impossible to do alone. Yet, open source is also our Achilles heel. There are different threats to our open source world. Some examples are free riders who use the tools but neglect cost and maximize their own personal benefit. There's also complacent bystanders who think someone else will do the work or support of open source. Perhaps I don't need to. And then there's maintainer burnout due to the lack of support, running on limited labor and with little recognition for the work that people put in every day. These all impact our possibility for success. So what can we and Jupiter do to fulfill the mission of the future? Some of our options are include experimenting with some new business models, such as some innovative businesses like Tidelift or Quantsite are doing. We could turn, open, we could turn pro the project into an open source business. We could charge users for support. We could put even more effort into grant funding, or I'd like to think that we can bring together two perspectives from economics. And I want to talk with you a little bit about a possible approach that can perhaps further future discussion. Together, business people, academics, and researchers need to raise the bar. We need to find out, are we asking the right questions? Do we know what infrastructure, people, and resources a project needs now? and in the future? And are we sharing the answers to those questions in an open and transparent way? We talk a lot about sustainability, but what do we really mean when we say that? Infrastructure, people working on existing projects to improve quality and then user experience. There's a number of questions about that. Eleanor Ostrom, a Nobel Prize winning economist, did research on common pooled resources and the tragedy of the commons. And she found that the tragedy of the commons is when individuals try to maximize their personal benefit at the expense of the group. Now, happily, she, her early work found that people were willing to work together as a group. And her early research de dealt with farms and limited resources, but later in her career, she started looking at knowledge and the digital information that is in this world. 
She felt that it was important that we learn to deal with the complexity other than just rejecting it. She felt that the danger of oversimplifying problems would lead us to solutions that weren't effective. Instead, what she found was people can self-organize and create communities and set rules that fit their system and they can be successful. She felt learning to trust was central to this cooperation. Maintaining the foundation of our projects is important. Unseen labor and invisible infrastructure make it difficult for businesses and users to see the large effort that's going into sustaining an ongoing project. We need better communications between users and providers to reduce the possibility that one group or one person is taken advantage of. This takes effort, intention, and desire. Sustaining while important does not evoke the same feelings of urgency and wonder as new uses of Jupiter. Sustaining tends to preserving the status quo, and sustaining alone does not bring us new products and services, lifelong learning, or prevent or cure Alzheimer's. By moving the discussion from just sustaining to also including open innovation, one of my former professors, Eric von Hippel, had done a lot of research work on entrepreneurship, innovation, and economics. And innovation encourages many new products and projects. And we have now easier access to engineering tools and a wealth of information on the internet. And what we're seeing is many more user innovators, the makers of our world. And they're making things to meet their needs, and not necessarily are they motivated by profits alone. Business, academia, and research each have their own strengths. So let's play to each group's strengths. Businesses are skilled at efficient workflows, scaling production, and reducing cost. Academia is great at sharing knowledge. Researchers bring new insights and focus on details. By leveraging these strengths, Businesses, academics, and researchers create real value. Each work they do helps us in some way. For example, in business, value can come from improving processes and improving their own people's skills and knowledge, or by building new uses within, on top of the platform that exists. I think we should look for solutions that combine both sustainability and innovation and work together to accomplish them. Jupyter Notebooks have rapidly become the de facto standard in data science. It's the first time in a long time that we have a universal, intuitive, and understandable way to change data into knowledge and actions. I talk about consortiums, but naming is hard. The bigger key is I want us to find solutions to support Jupiter and related projects. And I think to do that, we need to create value for individuals and also for organizations. And by creating value, I think we'll be successful. But I need your help to sustain Jupiter and the existing projects and also to innovate and find new uses to create value, to delight us, and improve our lives. So what can we specifically do? Fernando Perez shared some good first steps when he reflected back on John Hunter's work on Matplotlib. John encouraged people to set the bar high for your dreams and goals. He reminded folks to act with uncompromising integrity, never-ending intellectual curiosity, and to practice unbounded generosity to all who cross your path. Share wonder, change the world. It's my sincere hope that in five years, we're back here attending JupyterCon 2023, and that we say, wow, look at all the amazing things and how much we businesses, academics, and researchers have accomplished together. By embracing the wonder and possibilities that Jupiter offers, we have the power to connect 
create value, connect lifelong learners, and most importantly, improve the world that we share. Thank you. <laughs>